You know, as, as I share with you today, um, uh, God really began to redirect my heart on this message uh, probably a, a week ago. I, I work on sermons probably, you know, two months out. I've told you that before. And probably 90% of what I put together a couple months ago, you know, I tweak it and, and things like that and continue to stay current. But that's pretty much what you hear. Um, and I think God works in that process. I think planning and being prepared is a good thing. But uh, sometimes things happen, and, and God just begins to direct your heart a different way. And that's what happened with this message. And I kind of knew that was going to happen. I kind of sensed that. I sensed something was going to happen. And it's just odd that it worked out that way. And then this things happened in our country over the last uh, several days. I just felt like God saying, you need, to, you need to go a little different direction we were going. So I literally didn't come out of my house from Thursday evening till last night. Um, when I came over here. I mean, I stayed in the house all day on Friday and all day on Saturday. I came here to worship last night. So um, we need to pray about what I'm about to do here, okay? <laughs> Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time uh, that we come together and ask God that you would just uh, bless and you would speak. Uh, Lord, uh, uh, forgive me of my sins as uh, one who stands before people because, Lord, I know I'm not worthy on my own, only through the righteousness of Jesus and your calling. And so I just pray, God, that you'll just uh, help me communicate clearly uh, your word uh, to this congregation today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And we agreed and said? Amen. Well, a tour bus driver in Chattanooga, Tennessee, was describing various Civil War sites around the city. And he said, now over here, our southern boys really put it to the Yanks. And up here is another battlefield where the Confederate soldiers held their ground for hours and eventually won. And over here is the site of another decisive Southern victory. And somebody on the bus finally asked the driver, did the Union Army win any battles in Chattanooga? And the tour guide replied, not as long as I'm driving this bus, they didn't. <laughs> you know, it's nothing new for people to have a selective memory. We, we all tend to want to rewrite history according to our personal biases. Or if we don't know history, we just make it up according to what we think it should be. Maybe you heard about the first grade teacher who gave each student in her class the first half of a well-known saying and asked them to complete it. For example, she said, finish this, people in glass houses shouldn't throw stones is how it should read. But the first graders had their own unique take on how these popular sayings would go. Their versions went like this, people in glass houses shouldn't run around naked. <laughs> Better safe than punch a fifth grader. Don't bite the hand that looks dirty. You can't teach an old dog math. A penny saved is not much. And when the blind lead the blind, get out of the way. I don't think that's the original intent of those sayings, do you? But those first graders aren't the only ones who don't understand history. Take a look at this YouTube video real quickly from a media analyst named Mark Dice who does an on-the-boardwalk interview at a beach in California. Take a look. What country famously broke away from England to start their own country in the late 1700s? I have no idea, man. I'm, I don't know. <laughs> what are we celebrating on the 4th of July? Exactly? Our independence. A little more specific. It's the day that we overtook the South. And it's the day that um, it's our independence. It's, that's why we have the flag. From the South. From the South, exactly. How many stars on this flag? Uh, 50-something. Uh, what are we celebrating on the 4th of July, exactly? Independence Day? Specifically... Our... I don't know. <laughs> I'm so bad at this. Say Independence Day. Say when we won our independence. From? Those countries. <laughs> Name one of the founding fathers of America. <laughs> I don't want to do this. You don't know? <laughs> What country we broke away from when we declared independence back in 1776? <laughs> <I'm good. laughs> 
didn't know. America celebrates the 4th of July. Is it Independence Day when you got rid, uh, rid of uh, Mother England, right? Yes, <laughs> we have, we've got foreigners that know why we, so, you know, well, uh, the foreigners everybody, know uh, why uh, we celebrate it more than Americans. Everybody do. loves to get rid of their, like, you know, like the, 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 col the colonizers, so it's, uh, it's always That's good. That's incredible. <laughs> it's always good. Thanks for knowing that. That's yeah. incredible, man. Have a good, one. have a good vacation. Is that comedy or is that tragedy? You know, why is it important to understand our history? Well, my friend Bob Russell, who is the originator of most of the content I'm presenting uh, today. So if you like it, we want to make sure we give him credit. And if you don't, it's because I delivered it poorly. Uh, he says there are at least three reasons why we need to understand history. First, it's important that we have an accurate view of history to enhance our identity. History gives us a sense of identity. History gives us roots and understanding of who we are and what we're to be. Parents will often say to their young people going off to college or going into the military, now you remember who you are. It's been said that a generation that ignores its history has no past and no future. In Joshua, the fourth chapter, the Bible records an incident where the nation of Israel was about to enter the promised land, but they had to cross over the Jordan River, and the spring rains had swollen the river to flood stage. Crossing the river would be dangerous, if not impossible, so God commanded the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant to go into the water first by faith. When they stepped in the water, the water upstream was dammed up, and the Israelites walked across on dry, dry ground, and then God ordered ordered a member of all 12 tribes to take a huge stone from the center of the river to pile it up on the bank of the river, 12 huge stones as a memorial of that event. And Joshua 4, 6 reads, this will serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. You see, God wanted coming generations to remember the miraculous ways he had delivered them so that they would have a sense of identity and know that they could trust him in the future. I think it's important that we in America have some sense of God's blessing in our past. Now, admittedly, some Christians exaggerate the spiritual history of our nation. Some suggest that America is God's chosen nation, and they would portray the founding fathers as spiritual giants almost more revered than the apostles of Jesus. Some have a hard time separating their love for country from their love for God. And they'll sing, God bless America, with more fervor than all to Jesus, I surrender. They're more eager to salute the flag than they are to study the Scriptures. But more prevalent in our day is the opposite extreme, and that is the attempt to delete any spirituality from America's history. People try to leave the impression that our forefathers intended to establish a morally neutral, entirely secular nation, and they delight in magnifying the flaws of America's founders, and they argue that since the Constitution was written by imperfect people in another era, it must be considered a floating or living document which has to be adapted to the culture. In their minds, our country is not anchored on constitutional law, but fluctuates according to Supreme Court interpretation. I think the key is to keep a balanced perspective. Christians shouldn't worship their country. We worship the God who gave us the country. I don't believe that America is the chosen nation, but I do believe God has blessed our country, and I'm thankful to be an American. I don't believe that our founding fathers were all fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. They made some terrible mistakes, and tolerating the institution of slavery as long as they did was one of those, and we paid a terrible price for that mistake. The Civil War saw 600,000 American deaths. More people died in the Civil War than in all of our other wars combined. But I do believe that our forefathers established certain principles that enabled God to bless this land. It's not the personal piety of our founding fathers that we esteem. It's the founding principles. There was a basic biblical worldview that they used to establish our nation. And those Bible-based principles have given the world the most materially prosperous, the greatest personal freedoms, the most widely traveled, the most educated citizenry ever known. Psalm 33:12 says, "'Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord.'" 
Secondly, I think it's important for us to know our heritage to express appreciation. In the book of Deuteronomy, the eighth chapter, Moses was addressing the Israelites at the end of his life and just before they were about to go into the promised land. And he said, now you're going to a country that's very fruitful. But listen as I read from Deuteronomy 8, verse 10. When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he's given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I'm giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large, and your silver and gold increase, and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud, and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Verse 17, you may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me, but remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the ability to produce wealth. If you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and worship and bow down to them, I testify against you today that you will surely be destroyed. God said, you remember how I delivered you, and you appreciate your history, and you obey my commands, or you will be destroyed. Have you ever wondered why the revolutionary forces were victorious over the mighty British Empire? I mean, Britain was the most powerful military force in the world. And these 13 little scattered colonies weren't very significant. That would be like Puerto Rico declaring independence from the United States and then declaring war on us. How were we able to win? I think God performed some mighty wonders in the beginning of this nation that started well before the Revolutionary War. In order to appreciate the Declaration of Independence, we need to understand the prolonged political and spiritual oppression from Great Britain. The American Revolution was not an impulsive rebellion against the high taxes on tea. It had a long buildup. It was the result of over 100 years of political and spiritual oppression from its English motherland. In fact, the strongest appeals for revolution in America came from the pulpits of the land where preachers were using texts like Galatians 5.1 that says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. And they were quoting from Colossians chapter 1 that Christ is to have supremacy in all things. And from that, a saying went up and down the colonies that went like this, no king but king. King Jesus. No king but King Jesus. Let me give you an example of how that played out. In 1683, this is over uh, about 90 years before the Revolutionary War, King Charles II of England had his ego wounded because the people of Massachusetts were too independent. In fact, reports came back to the king, you can go through all the town of Boston and you'll never see a British flag. So King Charles demanded that Massachusetts swear allegiance to the crown and agree that only members of the official church of England, of England the Anglican church, could vote or they would lose their charter. Now, when news came to the colonies, they gathered to decide what they were going to do about the king's demand. Increase Mather. That's actually the man's name. Did you, met, you ever met a man named Increase? Increase Mather was a dynamic preacher and leader in the early colonies in Boston. He later became the president of Harvard when Harvard used to train preachers. And when these people gathered to say, what are we going to do about the king's demand, Increase Mather rose to speak, and he said, if we submit to the king's requirement that we be submissive to the church of England again, we will betray everything that our forefathers came to America for, and we will be sinning against God. Now, here's the statement he makes that I love. He said, I say, let's put our lives in the hands of God, and who knows what he will do for us. When he was finished, the people were in tears, and they voted unanimously not to submit to the king's decree, and the other colonies along the, the, the eastern seaboard followed suit. When word of this rebellion reached King Charles II, he was outraged, and he decided to send Colonel Percy Kirk to America with 5,000 troops to crush this rebellion. And when the colonists learned of that, they were terrified because he was known as Bloody Kirk. He was ruthless in grinding down any opposition anywhere to the king. But Increase Mather went to his study. He had such a burden for the colonies. He records that he spent the entire day on his knees praying and fasting for the colonies. And he said at the end of the day, his burden was lifted, and he felt that God was going to take care of them. Several weeks later, 
The colonies received news that King Charles II had suddenly died of a stroke, and the colonies were devastated to hear that news, as you could imagine. <laughs> Bloody Kirk wouldn't be coming after all, and all New England was relieved. And Increase Mather calculated the day King Charles II died, and he discovered that the day he died was the day he spent fasting and in prayer in his study. I would not want Increase Mather praying against me, would you? <laughs> Friends, the history of our nation is filled with testimonies of people who trusted God in troubled times and saw His hand of providence deliver them time and time again. That's why the psalmist said in Psalm 61, 5, you have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. That's true of our nation, and we need to appreciate that. The third reason I think it's important that we have a sense of history is for the proper interpretation of the Constitution. Now, our country, contrary to popular view, is not a pure democracy. We are a constitutional republic. Our country is based on laws which are outlined in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Without respect for the Constitution, our country would be in chaos. That is the meaning of the Watergate decision in the Nixon presidency. Nobody's above the law, not even the President of the United States. Think of it like this. The game of baseball is built on a rule book. And that rule book has pretty much stayed intact for about 100 years. Without the rule book, the game would be chaos. But there are judges who have to interpret the rules. They're called umpires. And so, for example, the rule book says that a strike in baseball is between the knees and the letters on the chest. But the umpire has to interpret what's a ball, what's a strike, all right? Let's say a team came out of their dugout and their letters weren't on their chest, but they had moved the letters down to the waist. Well, the umpires would have to go back and remember the intent of that rule. So we have judges to interpret the laws according to the intent of the framers of the Constitution. Now, that is not always easy to do because it's very complex matters, the governing of a country, and the King's English in which it was originally written can be a little hard to understand, kind of like trying to read a King James Bible. Someone has commented about how the English language can be so confusing, and they said, how else do you explain that there's no egg and eggplant, no ham and hamburger? <laughs> Why is it that boxing rings are square? And if a vegetarian eats only vegetables, what does a humanitarian eat? <laughs> and if con is the opposite of pro, does that mean that Congress is the opposite of progress? <laughs> and why are they called apartments when they're all stuck together? And what other vernacular does the nose run, the feet smell? And who else drives on, uh, parks on driveways and drives on parkways? A wise man, a wise guy are the opposite, but a slim chance is the same as a fat chance. Now you go figure. Now, since the English language is a pretty complex language, it's imperative that the people of the land, especially the judges of the land, understand the intent of the Constitution so that it can be properly interpreted. Take, for example, the First Amendment that says, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. What exactly does the First Amendment mean? What was the intent of of the founding fathers. Did they mean there's to be no spiritual emphasis in any government-funded organization, or did they mean that the government was not to show favoritism to one particular denomination? Only when we read about our history do we fully understand the intent of the writers. By establishment of religion, they meant that the government was not to repeat the error of Great Britain, their homeland, where the Church of England was the official state-sanctioned religion and all others were oppressed by the state. A few years ago, I read an interesting book titled American Gospel, God, the Founding Fathers, and the Making of a Nation, written by John Meacham, who was at the time the managing editor of Newsweek magazine. And the premise that Meacham presents in the book is that America is a country that has been shaped by religion without being controlled by it. Now, that can be a hard distinction to discern. So, Meacham explains, the God who is spoken of and called on and prayed to in the public sphere 
is an essential character in the American drama. George Washington improvised, so help me God, at the conclusion of the first presidential oath and kissed the Bible on which he had sworn it. Abraham Lincoln saw the Civil War as an act of divine will that passed all understanding. It was, Lincoln thought, one of God's impenetrable mysteries. Our finest hours, the Revolutionary War, abolition, the expansion of the rights of women, fights against terror and tyranny, the battle against Jim Crow can be traced to religious ideas about liberty, justice, and charity. Yet, meet you, Madge, theology and Scripture have also been used to justify our worst hours, from enslaving black people to persecuting Native Americans to treating women as second-class citizens. Religion, he writes, is one of the most pervasive but least understood forces in American life. The founding fathers understood the dangers of mixing religious passions with the ambitions of politics. Their example, he concludes, can move us forward in this yet another age in which religion and politics provoke the most corrosive of debates. Now, you may disagree with what I'm about to say, and that's okay. I support your right to be wrong. This is America. <laughs> but I believe that our founding fathers' intent was not so much to create a Christian nation as it was to establish a nation where Christian influence can flourish as followers of Jesus Christ are free to be salt and light, flavoring and illuminating our culture without controlling it. Now, make no mistake about it, biblical laws, biblical symbolism, biblical quotations, and the spirit of Christian charity were intentionally woven into the fabric of our nation's founding documents, particularly the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. The Judeo-Christian worldview furnished the basis for political thought that guided our nation's rulers for nearly 150 years. But to establish a state-sponsored church, to mandate belief, to require religious devotion to a particular doctrine was clearly not the intent of our founding fathers. James Madison, our fourth president, hailed as the father of the Constitution, put it like this, whilst we assert for ourselves a freedom to embrace, to profess, and observe the religion which we believe to be of divine origin, we cannot deny an equal freedom to those whose minds have not yet yielded to the evidence which has convinced us. What does that mean? It means while many could and should believe, none must. And that is at the heart of a faith that brings freedom. That's how faith shapes our nation without controlling it. The founders believed that religion was an essential foundation for people's moral conduct and for American ideas about justice and decency and duty and responsibility. John Witherspoon was a Presbyterian minister and the president of what is now known as Princeton University. John Witherspoon was the only pastor to sign the Declaration of Independence. And Witherspoon said, he is the best friend of American liberty who is most sincere and active in promoting pure and undefiled religion. So here's our question today. How can we be a friend of liberty in today's world that seems so far removed from our founding heritage? I want to suggest four things. Number one, be good citizens, but don't put your hopes in a political solution. Be good citizens, but don't put your hopes in a political solution. The Apostle Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 2, Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against your soul. Live such lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God. Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as supreme authority or to governors who were sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. And you can see why statesman Daniel Webster was led to say, whatever it is that makes men good Christians makes them good citizens. Christian people should vote regularly and wisely. 
We should obey the law as far as it is consistent with the law of God. We should pay our taxes honestly. We should support government officials with encouragement and prayer. Some of you might need to get involved in the political system and run for office at different levels of government to make a difference. One of the ways that we can be good citizens is to teach our children our spiritual heritage because they're not learning about it in the public school system. But quite frankly, I put less and less hope in the political system. Now, in recent years, we've had some Christian people across the land who tried to get a moral majority or a coalition of Christians together as a powerful voting block. And the idea is if we can just get our people in positions of power, that we'll be able to restore our heritage. The problem is it hadn't worked. Even when we get our people in office, however you identify who your people are, many times they wilt under pressure. George Bush Sr. once said he wouldn't raise taxes, but he did. Barack Obama once said he believed marriage was between a man and a woman, but he doesn't. But a bigger problem, in my opinion, has been a non-elected Supreme Court that has overstepped its boundaries of constitutional authority. Listen, it started back in the early 60s when the Supreme Court arbitrarily removed prayer and Bible reading from school with no legal precedent even though the vast majority of people in the country at the time disagreed with that decision. So much for government of the people, by the people, and for the people. In 1973, the Supreme Court invalidated the abortion laws of all 50 states, legalizing abortion on demand. So much for states' rights. So much for a right to life. In 1980, the Supreme Court struck down a Kentucky law that required the posting of the Ten Commandments in the public school classrooms. The majority opinion of the court reasoned that the Ten Commandments were plainly religious and may induce children to read, meditate upon, and perhaps obey the commandments. And wouldn't that be awful? (laughs) So much for one nation under God. In 1997, the Supreme Court ruled that pornography on the Internet cannot be regulated because it would interfere with the freedom of the press. And columnist George Will wrote at the time, it is now a scandal beyond irony that thanks to the energetic litigation of civil liberties fanatics, pornographers enjoy expansive First Amendment protection while first graders in a nativity play are said to violate First Amendment values. Some of you will say, I know what the solution is. We've got to elect a series of conservative presidents so they will appoint conservative Supreme Court justices. But to be honest with you, that hadn't worked either. Justice Anthony Kennedy was appointed to the Supreme Court by Ronald Reagan, the hero of modern conservatives. There are some people, when they say Ronald Reagan, they cover their heart. (laughs) It was Justice Kennedy who wrote the majority opinion that redefined marriage in our country last week. My point is we cannot apply a political remedy to what is essentially a spiritual problem. Ephesians 6:12 reads, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Folks, Today, the battle going on is not between Democrats and Republicans. It's not between the Supreme Court and Congress and the White House. It's not between heterosexual marriage and homosexual marriage. It's not even between conservatives and liberals. The battle is between two opposing worldviews. One is the Judeo-Christian heritage that believes there is a God who created us, who sent his one and only son to be our Savior, and to whom one day we're all going to be accountable. And the other is humanism, which believes that man is his own authority and should should be free to do whatever is right in his own eyes or whatever he, whatever he can convince others to do. These two opposing worldviews have been on a collision course in our culture for some time, and the casualties are future generations. Judge Robert Bork, who was nominated for the Supreme Court, but rejected largely because he held to the view of natural law and therefore the God of nature, which is in the Declaration of Independence, wrote a poem that goes like this. God's plan made a hopeful beginning, but man spoiled his chances by sinning. We trust that the story will end with God's glory, but at present, the other side's winning. Folks, that's just the truth. So be good citizens, but don't put your hope in political solutions. The second thing we can do, be repentant instead of blaming others. Be repentant instead of blaming others. 
Second Chronicles 7.14 is kind of God's formula for the healing of a land. And it goes like this. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Now, notice the people God addresses. He doesn't say if the pagan political authorities will get their act together and if they'll repent. No, he says, if my people who are called by my name, I heard about a guy who went to the doctor because he had a serious problem. He said, doc, I just hurt all over. He said, if I press my finger to my, oh, he said, that hurts. And he said, if I press my finger to my, oh, he said, that hurts so bad. And if I press my finger, oh, that really hurts. And the doctor said, let's take some x-rays. The doctor came back a little later and he said, you definitely got a problem. We need to have to, we're going to have to operate. He said, what's my problem? Doc said, you got a broken finger. And now we point our finger of accusation at the Supreme Court, and we say, oh, boy, that hurts. And we point to Congress and say, man, that hurts. And we point to the Oval Office and we say, oh, that hurts. But the problem is with us. There's one primary source of a nation's ills according to the Bible, and that is a casual, complacent, convenience-based church. Listen to Romans 2.21 in the Living Bible. Well, then, if you teach others, why don't you teach yourself? You tell others not to steal, but do you steal? You say it's wrong to commit adultery, but do you do it? You condemn idolatry, but do you steal from pagan temples? You're so proud of knowing the law, but you dishonor God by breaking it. No wonder the scriptures say the world blasphemes the name of God because of you. Friends, don't blame other people. The problem, God says, is with my people. So what does he tell us to do? He says, you humble yourself. Let's acknowledge we're powerless to right this nation on our own. We've tried on our own, and it's not working. We've got to humble ourselves before God. And then he said, you pray, confess your sin, ask for God's forgiveness, pray for his intervention, and then you seek his face. That means you don't stay as far away from God as you can and see if you can still be saved. You get as close to him as you possibly can day by day, and then you repent of sin. You criticize corrupt business practices of big corporations? Are you honest in your business dealings? We shake our heads when we hear about affairs that end a marriage or a ministry. How's your marriage going? Are you loving and investing in your spouse? We complain about the trash on TV or in the movies. What do you entertain yourself watching? We complain about the greed and selfish lifestyles of others. How's your giving? What's your level of generosity? We're outraged when a white man kills nine people in a black church. How's your attitude toward people of other races? We're distressed about divisions in the church. Are you pouting because your preferences aren't being preferred? Are we quick to judge and condemn others? He says, repent of sin and go before God and say, search me, God, and try me and see if there be any wicked way in me and cleanse me of my sin. And then he promises, I will hear from heaven and I'll forgive your sin and I'll heal heal your land. Friends, the future stability of this nation has little to do with the people who go into office. It mostly has to do with people who go into worship. That brings me to the third thing we can do. Be courageous when you have opportunity to stand for the truth. 2 Timothy 1, 7 reads, For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and of love, and of self-discipline. And then he concludes, so don't be afraid to testify about our Lord. Our spiritual forefathers, whom God used mightily, were not wimps. They were courageous people. You go all the way back to the Old Testament. When Daniel was told, don't pray to anybody but the king, Daniel went home, went to his upper story room, opened the window to face Jerusalem, and prayed the way he always did. Now, he was arrested, thrown into a lion's den, and we know God spared him, but he didn't know that at the time. That took courage. In the New Testament, Peter and John were told by the powers that be, you don't speak anymore in the streets of Jerusalem. You keep quiet about Jesus. And they said, we have to obey God, not you. We can't help but speak of what we've seen and heard. And they went out preaching. That took courage. Think about the courage of the 56 men who signed the Declaration of Independence. They endorsed this line with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. We mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. That took courage. 
That wasn't just high-sounding rhetoric. They knew if they succeeded, the very best they could expect was a new struggling nation. If the revolution failed, they'd face a hangman's noose as traitors. Of the 56 who signed the Declaration of Independence, not many survived. Five were captured by the British and tortured before they died. Twelve had their homes sacked, looted, occupied by the enemy, or burned. Two lost their sons in the war. One had two sons captured. Nine of the 56 died in the war itself. But they fulfilled their pledge, and freedom was born because they had courage. You know what? By the power of God's Spirit, we've got to reach down inside today and develop that kind of resolve. We've got to be courageous enough to stand for the truth even when it's not popular. Like New Testament times, we've got to acknowledge that for the most part, we're living as foreigners and aliens in this culture. Listen to me, folks. We're no longer the home team. And the quicker we realize that and come to terms with that, the better we'll be able to see what God is saying to us and doing among us right now. And if you take a bold but loving stand for the truth today, you will be labeled intolerant, fanatical, dangerous, homophobic, unloving, bigoted. Stop looking for approval and applause from the world. Cultural Christianity is dead. Convictional Christianity will never die. If the church stands for the conviction that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through him, it will be criticized in the press. It may one day be picketed. It may be slandered in casual conversation. We may be stripped of some freedoms we have enjoyed. But the governments of this world are not the source of our freedoms. God is and has always been no king but King Jesus. And Jesus said... Jesus, our king, said, beware. If the world hates me, it's going to hate you. No servant is above his master. Friends, the Christian life has never been a playground. It has always been a battlefield. We have to toughen up and develop a soldier's mentality. Expect opposition. Don't be intimidated by it. And for goodness sake, don't be ashamed of Jesus Christ and his word. That's like being ashamed of good health and a plague. 1 Corinthians 16, 13 says, be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be men of courage, be strong, but do everything in love. In the history of the church, the church was at most effective when she did not lead the world, nor did she echo the world. She confronted the world with the grace and truth of Jesus Christ, and they didn't do it through protest or marches. They outloved, they outplayed, they outgave everyone around them, and they turned their world upside down. Amen. That brings me to the last thing that I think we need to do. We need to be hopeful because with God, all things are possible. You know, I know so many of you over these last several days, you've been so pessimistic and so down and grieved about the future of our nation, and we need to grieve some. And people will say, well, it's all over. We've become so pagan, so corrupt. We're no match for the powers that be. But we're forgetting one huge factor, and that is with God, all things are possible. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably, immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all. Everybody say that word with me. All generations. David Platt said, Nothing is impossible for the man or woman who trusts in the power of God to accomplish the will of God. Let me tell you about a great revival that took place many, many years ago in my home state of Kentucky. Peter Marshall and David Manuel in the book From Sea to Shining Sea talk about what happened in Kentucky in 1800. Of all the untamed territory in America, settlers in Kentucky were the most isolated and dangerous. Most of the settlers who headed there were convinced they needed no one for them. Kentucky meant a life of complete freedom. Partly as a result of living that way, they became in many cases a little crazy and a little more than lawless. And the book talks about how people in Kentucky were tough because they fought wild animals and they fought off would-be attackers, and when they got some liquor in them, they fought each other. <laughs> that sounds like one of my family reunions, personally. <laughs> one man said you could tell somebody from Kentucky they didn't have an ear, they had an eye gouged out, and they didn't have any teeth. And that's why the toothbrush was invented in Kentucky, because if it had been invented anywhere else, it'd be called a teeth brush. <laughs> Let that kind of spread over you there. 
Get that? Kentuckians at the turn of the 18th century were a tough bunch. Anybody here ever hear of Logan County, Kentucky? You ever heard of that? Some of you admit that. One of the roughest counties in all of Kentucky was Logan County in the southwest corner. Technically, it was under United States law before Kentucky was admitted to the Union in 1796. The trouble was no one on the frontier was designed to enforce the law or didn't want to. That led to Logan County attracting so many murderers and horse thieves and highway robbers and counterfeiters that it was nicknamed Rogue's Harbor by the outlaws who fled there to escape justice back east. But in 1798, into Rogue's Harbor rode a pioneer preacher named the Reverend James McCready. Historians say McCready wore buckskin breeches and had a plain spoken style, but he could talk about heaven in such a way you could see all its glories and about hell in such a way that you could feel its flames. James McCready started preaching the gospel, and a few people in Logan County began following Jesus. And he started three little churches that he preached at, one in Red River, one in Gasper River, and one in Muddy River. And he asked these people in these little churches to pray every Saturday and every Sunday for revival in Logan County. And every third Saturday, they had a day of fasting and prayer for revival. Well, within a year, revival began to break out. The first instance was at the Red River Congregation during the quarterly communion service of July 1799 where some of the boldest, most daring sinners in the county covered their faces and wept bitterly, according to historical records. A month later, there was the same kind of series of services at the Gasper River Church. News had spread, and 500 people showed up. They couldn't get them all in their little building, so they met outside. The last service of the meeting, the Holy Spirit flowed, and a solemn weeping fell over the house. Floods of salvation swept through the assembly. Screams for mercy pierced the heavens, and people were crying out, What shall we do to be saved, according to McCready's journal? The news of the revival spread, and a year later, a similar meeting was prepared at the Gasper River Church, and people started coming from everywhere, and 10,000 people showed up at the Gasper River Church in Logan County, Kentucky. McCready had sent out word to other preachers from the state to come and help with this revival of 10,000 people. He couldn't handle it on his own. One of the preachers who came was a guy named Barton W. Stone, who preached at the Cane Ridge Presbyterian Church in Bourbon County, Kentucky, outside the town of Paris called the Cane Ridge Presbyterian Church. Stone was so impressed with this revival and the way God was changing lives in Logan County, he came back the next year and told his church in Bourbon County that we need to do a revival like that. Days before the revival at Cane Ridge, people started showing up in wagons. Stone had invited preachers from all different denominations. He said, it doesn't matter what your denominational background is, as long as you preach Jesus Christ and as long as sinners are converted. And by the time the Cane Ridge revival started, they cut down trees and they made pews out of them and they made platforms for the preachers to preach on. 25,000 people came to that revival. Some came because they were curious. Some came because they had never seen more than five people in their whole lives and they wanted to see what a crowd looked like. 25,000 people was one-eighth the population of the state of Kentucky at the time. And the Holy Spirit began to move and flow, and people were converted to Jesus. And yes, if you read the history, some weird stuff happened. People started barking and jerking and laughing, and I can't explain all that. But they stayed for weeks, and they had to have food brought in because God was doing something special at Cane Ridge. And Peter Marshall asked in the book, what of the aftermath? Did the great revival have a permanent effect on the state of Kentucky. He said in three years, the Baptists increased 10,000 members, and so did the Methodists, and the Presbyterians increased many fold. Also out of that Cane Ridge revival came a group called the Christian Church, a group of people who said, let's forget about denominational differences. We're not the only Christians. We just want to be Christians only. We just want to exalt Jesus Christ and go back to the basics of the Bible and what we call the restoration movement and churches like Lakeview Christian Church, which became Journey Christian Church, trace our spiritual heritage to that revival and that movement. But here's the paragraph. Here's the paragraph I want to conclude with. Foreign travelers who'd been to Kentucky before could hardly believe that they were in the same state 
Whereas before, isolation and drunken brawling had been among the most memorable aspects of the people who lived there, now there were churches and churchgoers who behaved like good Christians elsewhere on the frontier. Now there was fellowship and neighbors caring for one another and raising barns and clearing fields together. In other words, they loved God, they loved people, and they served their world. And I, my question to you today is this, can that happen again? It has happened time and time throughout the New Testament age, from CDC ports like Corinth to lawless frontiers like Logan County, Kentucky. And I believe God can move even in post-Christian America in places like Apopka and Mount Dora. Because listen to me, our hope is not in old glory. Our hope is Christ in us, the hope of glory. John Piper said, John Piper said, there's a difference between... Uncle Sam and Jesus Christ. Uncle Sam wants to enlist you only when you're healthy. Jesus Christ wants to enlist you only if you admit you're sick. But if he, he will heal you of your terminal disease of sin and not only grant you forgiveness of sin and eternal life, he will make you a better citizen. He'll make you a better worker. He'll make you a better member of the family. And oh God, Oh, God, that's what this country needs now more than ever. Friends, I believe there has never been a better time in our lifetime to be the church. In the words of old Increase Mather, I say, let's put our lives in the hands of God, and who knows what he will do for us. Amen. I'm going to ask us right now. I'm going to ask you to do something we rarely do here. Maybe we've never done since I've been here, but I want you to do it with me if you're able to. A little bit old school. I want to ask if you're physically able to get on your knees and to kneel where you are. If you can't do that, just get in the most humble posture that you possibly can. But if you can kneel, I'm going to ask you to kneel right now. And I want us to pray. I know the floor is hard, and I won't keep you down there long, but I feel like we need to get on our knees as a congregation, and let's pray together. I want to share the words of a prayer written by Max Lucado for a National Day of Prayer. Father, as we are on our knees, either physically or in our hearts, we say not to us, O oh Lord, but to you goes all the glory. We depend on you. You give birth and breath, and you determine our days. You make every nation. You set every boundary. We exist by your power. We exist for your glory. Showcase your power through this land again. Display your justice in our courts and your wisdom in our governments, your guidance in our schools, and your love in our homes. Have mercy upon our sins, O oh God. We have disrespected your word. We've disregarded your gifts. We've discarded your children, and we are sorry. Forgive us, dear Father. Grant strength to all our leaders. May they serve you first and honor you most. Remind us of the brevity of this life and the beauty of the next. Prepare our souls for the day we meet you in eternity. Until then, let us carry out your mission of making disciples of all nations. This we pray in the strong name of our Savior, Jesus, who is our hope of glory. We all agreed, and we said... Amen. Amen.